It really is risen. Is risen. Really is risen. Thank you, everybody. That was a great joy to celebrate the Vespers for Saints Constantine and Helen, which is the perfect segue for our class tonight on So Great a Cloud of Witnesses. Thank you all of the singers who are part of that. Um, the way we do this, um, for those of you who are watching on Zoom, that's more of a passive experience, or on YouTube, that's a kind of a passive experience. For those of you on Zoom, uh, you may participate in this class and help uh, answer questions, ask questions, do some of the readings that we'll encounter throughout the uh, time that we're here together. But let's get right into it, shall we? And let me share my screen. Oh, let me uh, share screen first. Do do. Looky there. So great a cloud of witnesses. So today, as I mentioned at the beginning, our topic is holy leaders, holy teachers. And we have some incredible women saints in the church who are examples of holy leaders and holy teachers. And we're going to look at three of them tonight. The questions we want to ask are, what are some examples of women leaders in Orthodox Christian history and tradition? What lessons about leadership do they give us today? And as we do this, we are inspired by uh, the reading of St. John, which is read during the Feast of Mid-Pentecost that we just completed earlier today. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. The women saints and the women leaders judged with righteous judgment, and we also look at them with the same. Our first saint for the night is the saint of the day. You might know her as Flavia Julia Elena Augusta, or St. Helen for short. Of course, this is her full Roman name, but she was not born a Roman. She was born a Lenny from Drapana, a little town in the country of Bithynia. If you know where Bithynia is, it is a little region in Asia Minor, just to the east of um, the Bosporus and where Constantinople is a little bit farther inland. And uh, she came from humble origins. She was born around 246 to 248 AD. She was not a noble woman by birth. Uh, she is described in one of her biographies, I believe it's Ambrose of Milan, as a bona stabularia. A very uh, literal interpretation of that would be a good stable maid but a more generous interpretation would be innkeeper. Um, the truth may be somewhere in between because of the age at which she would meet the man who would become um, her wife, consort, or concubine, or the, the, the man who would become her husband, uh, to which she would be the wife, consort, or concubine, the Emperor Exentius, she met in 270. So she only would have been about 22 to 24 years of age. Um, either she was the innkeeper or owner at that point, or just a staff at an innkeeper. Uh, we don't know. But we do know that she was in a regular kind of life in the countryside of Bithynia. Somewhere along the line, the Emperor Constantius, as he was on one of his military campaigns through that region, heading east uh, and one of the military raids, and the, the legends around their meeting say that it was kind of a love at first sight moment. They were both wearing bracelets that seemed to be almost identical to one another, and he took it as a sign that she was his uh, uh, soulmate. It's a very romantic idea. Um, but um, as we shall see, it didn't necessarily work out that way. However, what then becomes, uh, and, and also the, the histories, by the way, are not clear as to what the relationship was. Now, this was a very different time for emperors and nobility in, in the Roman Empire. A common man could rise to become emperor. So there was not this kind of ensconced nobility looking down on the common person the same way that would develop maybe in later kingdoms and hierarchies and so forth. Uh, Diocletian himself was a Dacian who, who rose through the military ranks and seized kind of power, for example. So these uh, figures were not so distant from everyday people. In Rome, it was, uh, you know, like New York. If you, if you could make it there, you can make it anywhere. And um, 
In any case, he develops this relationship with her. Some describe them as uh, officially a wife, others as his consort, which is more of a formal title for an emperor's um, spouse or partner, or in some cases might treat her, uh, some histories might describe her more as a concubine, which is you know obviously less uh, appealing, some say common law wife. In any case, we don't know for sure, the, 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 the sources all are, are mixed, and it kind of probably has to do with the historian's view of the royal family. Nonetheless, she became the mother of Constantine, who we also commemorate today, Constantine the Great, the emperor, uh, and they're both listed in, in, the, in the calendar as equals to the apostles, as we shall see. And Emperor Constantine, of course, will succeed after his father and, in fact, unite the empire. She divorced, unfortunately, from Constantius, whatever that might have meant at the time, uh, about close to 20 years into their marriage for political gain. He did realize that... Um, she did not necessarily provide any political clout or power, and so um, he needed to forge an alliance with Maxentius and um, decided to marry someone uh, related to Maxentius, maybe a, a daughter or sister, something like that. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head. One of those political arrangements. However, um, after uh, Constantius... Uh, dies and Constantine is made emperor or co-emperor or emperor in one half of the empire, basically in 306. Later he'll consolidate, as we'll see. Uh, she eventually returns to court. She had been kind of out of the spotlight for close to what about 20 years or so, and um, now she finally is returning to court. And shortly uh, thereafter, another few years, she receives the grand title of Augusta Imperatrix literally an empress, and she is given uh, spending authority over the royal treasuries to spend as she wills on projects that she wills at her discretion. So a very influential and powerful person at the towards the end of her life for sure, and definitely throughout the story of the Roman Empire, uh, Roman Empire and especially the life of Constantine. Uh, this picture here, by the way, is um, an eagle cameo of the royal family. It is from late antiquity. It was probably commissioned right around 316 um, AD. So it's a very early depiction of the royal family. It was later incorporated into the Ada Gospels, which was in the medieval period, um, the time of, I believe, Charlemagne. Um, and uh, the, 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 so the gold work around that is part of a larger um, gospel cover. But that piece itself is actually very ancient. Eleni took her own spiritual journeys as she was going along. What's uh, kind of interesting is that she, in many stories you might expect, the mother raises the son to become the Christian. But actually in this case, though she raised her son to be the man he would be, it was through his experience in the battle at the Milvan Bridge where he beheld the cross and was told, you know, and this sign conquered. And it was through the cross and his conversion of Christianity that he was able to overcome his adversaries. She converted to Christianity because of him. Now, you might say, well, that sounds awfully expedient of her. And that's one of the challenges that, of course, modern and more pessimistic, I would say skeptical, I should just say narrow kind of pessimistic historians take a look at these individuals. Uh, nonetheless, uh, sources describe her becoming a person of genuine faith, and we'll take a look at some of the histories from her time. Uh, very significantly, she made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem and to the Holy Land around the years 326 to 328, where she did incredible work. And of course, if you're um, familiar with the Orthodox uh, festal calendar, you know that one of the major feasts of the church has to do with the experience that she had on this pilgrimage, which is the finding of the true cross. So every year in September, in mid-September, we celebrate the finding of the true cross and the exaltation of the cross is what the feast is called because of the, the miracle that was associated with the lifting up of the cross at the time. We, that's also a time in which we commemorate that vision of St. Constantine at the Battle of the Milvan Bridge as well, by the way. Uh, and the icon of here, of course, shows her holding the cross. 
Uh, while she was there, she was involved with the founding of some of the most important churches of the Holy Land and of, really of all Christendom, the first and foremost being the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which she helped design and establish and participate in that process, but also the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, uh, the Church of the Ascension on the Mount of Olives, which later was um, destroyed by the Persians in the 7th century. Uh, it's now the Church of uh, Eleona, the, the Church of the Olives. Um, today, uh, she's also attributed with establishing the uh, the monastery in at the foot of Mount Sinai, which is later known as Saint Catherine's Monastery, but actually at the beginning was um, the monastery of the Burning Bush, and there was a chapel later established to Saint Helen there as well, uh, because she was one of the first sponsors of that location. Now, here is a uh, quote from Eusebius, the contemporary church historian who lived in her day. And if we could ask for a volunteer to read this out loud for us, I would love to get somebody to do that. Prayachasa, if you can call on somebody, my co-host. Uh, how about Cindy? Make sure they're allowed okay. to talk. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. We had a little muting problem. <laughs> While, however, her character derived luster from such deeds as I have described, she was far from neglecting personal piety toward God. She might be seen continually frequenting his church, while at the same time she adorned the houses of prayer with splendid offerings not overlooking the churches of the smallest cities. In short, this admirable woman was to be seen in simple and modest attire, mingling with the crowd of worshipers and testifying her devotion to God by a uniform course of pious conduct. Thank you very much. The, uh, the such deeds as I have described uh, that Eusebius is talking about is exactly what I was just talking about with regards to establishing these big churches in the Holy Land and so forth. But you can see that that wasn't just a... Um, political opportunism on her part at the time, but really part of a consistent expression of her character of faith and piety. She uh, loved church. And remember, she, having come from a humble background, was also uh, not uncomfortable around um, the crowd of worshipers, as it says. In another quote from Eusebius, if we could have another reader, there is a beautiful description here of her at the end of her life. Oh, by the way, if you want to, this statue here is a statue of her from, from antiquity as well. And you know, you can see it's a, a fairly simple and modest attire, as Eusebius describes. Okay, do we have a reader for this? You can use your raise hand function to let me know. about Christina and when at length at the close of a long life she was called to inherit a happier lot having arrived at the 18 18th year of her age and being very near at the time of her departure this thrice blessed woman died in the presence of her illusion illustrious son who was in attendance at her side caring for her and held her hands so that to those who rightly discerned the truth the thrice blessed one seemed not to die but to ex experience a real change and transition from an earthly to a heavenly existence since her soul remolded as it were into an incorruptible and angelic essence and was received up into her savior's presence Thank you, Christina. Again, the pessimist reads this as uh, as a kind of a legendary encomium to a grand figure in uh, you know uh, fluffing up the story of the empress. Um, but I can tell you that as a priest who has personally experienced being at the bedside of of some pretty uh, amazing people as they departed this life before us, what he describes is by no means limited to. Um, legend. It is definitely a description of what happens when somebody dies in grace. 
there is definitely this sense of transition to an angelic life. Sometimes there is even um, kind of a sense of a glow of, of light around them as they depart this life before us. And um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too pessimistic or skeptical about this reading. I think it's actually probably a fairly good description of, of the end of this woman's life. Uh, what you see here on the right is the grand sarcophagus of uh, St. Helen, which is in Rome. However, uh, she wasn't necessarily originally buried there, and actually some of her remains might be elsewhere. Uh, as is often the case with these early saints, she probably was interred first at Constantinople and then transferred here and there. There's different stories about where her various um, uh, aspects of her relics have been to. Uh, but nonetheless, she has continued to be a figure inspiring uh, the Christian world since then. So, her legend and her legacy, among the things that she contributes to human history, not just Christian history, uh, as the discoverer of the true cross and other relics, I like to call her the patron saint of archaeology. Her expedition and the work she did, the fact that she tested uh, through a very uh, specific procedure which, which of these pieces of wood might actually be the true cross in a very almost scientific manner, you know, making sure... It wasn't just wishful thinking, it is also the sign of this kind of sharp scientific thinking that I think is really exceptional. Uh, of course, we mentioned the churches that she established in the Holy Land, which continue today to be centers of Christianity, which continue today to be important and significant places of pilgrimage throughout the world. Uh, really, in a way, she, um, if you consider that Constantine. Constantine le first legalized Christianity. He ended the persecution against Christians. And then by basically adopting Christianity as his own faith, and then with his mother doing the same, he kind of made Christianity cool, if you will, for the first time in history. It was like not just something that the you know uh, outsiders or rebels or suspicious individuals, but it really it had already become... Um, the a dominant religion in the Roman Empire, but this really pushed it over the edge. And what she was, what she did, had the effect of opening up the Holy Land um, to become the place of pilgrimage that it would. At, at that time, it was kind of a backwater uh, where the Holy Sepulchre was was a kind of an old Temple of Venus that had been there for a couple hundred years after Hadrian. Um, so there wasn't there wasn't a, a, as much for Christians to to look up to and to discover and to find as, as holy centers. And uh, she really changed that for, for the faith. And uh, would, I think that would be the beginning of many other um, movements within Christianity as well on many different levels. She was a philanthropist. She promulgated the Imperial Christianity. She helped reconcile East and West. Remember that her son, um, was part of that process of being the emperor of the West and then kind of conquering Maxentius and uniting the East with the West and uniting this one empire, moving the uh, capital to Constantinople, consolidating power and establishing a really lasting um, empire for, for Christendom for many centuries, actually, afterwards. I, I would say you don't really see it quite riven until Rome falls and develops in its own track uh, a few hundred years later, maybe not a few, maybe not that long after, but still a couple hundred years of solid Roman rule across the whole region, and she was definitely a part of that. So we look at this as as uh, as Orthodox Christians, and we have this tendency to elevate and exalt holy rulers, even though we know very well that being a ruler is a dirty job. Constantine himself delayed baptism in his own life until his deathbed, essentially, partly because as a Roman emperor, he had blood on his hands as a, as a, as a military man uh, and a man who had to make decisions that involved violence and battle. And we know that uh, especially the Roman rulers, uh, and even once they were being baptized, definitely had uh, instances of, of uh, bloody hands. Let's put it that way. So we can be very, again, pessimistic or skeptical or kind of negative about these figures, but we also see that God works through such figures. God works through these imperfect people, uh, through people with, with broken family lives, with 
with with violence in the family, as you see here, actually, literally, you know, emperors fighting each other in grand battles. But God still works through their lives for the betterment of the whole community, for the betterment of the whole church. And that is something that is consistently seen throughout the world. So, so the church, while being realistic about that, is also very charitable and uh, forgiving and recognizing that God's sanctity works through individuals of all kinds of backgrounds. So what might seem to some as just political necessity, we can also see as the acts of providence in their lives. Okay, so that is a kind of a summary of the life of St. Helen and her contributions. And she becomes kind of a, a prototype among uh, women rulers after that. There are, there are other empress saints, St. Saint Alexandra, was an empress saint, um, for example. Uh, but she is the first kind of of the Christian empires, okay, of the Christian imperial families. But before then, uh, you might have seen an, an empress, uh, but this was finally when it was legal. And then, so therefore, she becomes this kind of prototype for ruling women thereafter. But also really a great example for, uh, for all of us, whether our empires are basically the size of our households, or maybe we have some jurisdiction over a few. Uh, nonetheless, we all can benefit from her, from her example. So your first question for reflection tonight, what challenges do women face today in living a genuine Christian life? How do the demands of marriage and family impact that life? Can be no doubt that uh, the, the life of St. Helen was extraordinarily complicated an extraordinary complex with a great deal of responsibility. Everything she did was being watched, I'm sure. How did she live that Christian life? How did she reflect the gospel in the way that she dealt with it? And how would you? Question two, how does one reconcile the demands of faith in Jesus Christ with the compromises of leadership in the fallen world? Can one really be a saint when one wields earthly political power? Well, we actually all wield some earthly political power, um, even if it's isolated, you know, to our own, what's inside our own heads. You know, sometimes it's that, that limited, you know, no one's in there telling us what to think or not. Sometimes it's over a family. Sometimes it's over a business. Sometimes it's over a department or part of an agency or part of a, uh, team at work. We wield political power all the time, actually. And that's not to say, as the Marxists do, that everything should be reduced to political power, but everything does have kind of a political dimension because polis means people. Political just means dealing with people. We are all in these relationships, tugging and pulling with each other to get what we want all the time. We have these issues. How can you do that as a Christian without completely compromising? your integrity. That's the kind of thing that these saints can show us. So your homework question, if you will, uh, which we normally do in a group discussion if we were together physically, is give three examples of individuals who attempted with some success to bridge Christian faith and leadership publicly. Maybe you have three in mind that come immediately to your mind. Maybe you're a little more skeptical of the world and you think, I don't know, are there really who have been successful? It's hard. It really is hard. And you want to think of examples that are really powerful and really speak to you and inspire you. And so I just encourage you to think about that. Um, I'm one of those very skeptical types. I generally look at almost all politicians, male and female, as, as, a, as uh, the oldest profession in the book, um, <clears throat> which is not a very positive view. But there are many who do have faith. They are genuine believers, and they do try to exercise their faith responsibly and lead in, their, in the world. So think of some. Who, do you, who inspires you today? All right. Do we have any questions before we go on to the next saint? Because I'm kind of I'm moving quickly if I, if I can, but I'm happy to take some questions. If you do raise your hand or chat and Pratasa will tell me to be quiet for a second. All right, the next saint that we have today, and feel free again to interrupt if you want, 
Macrina the Younger. Many of you probably know of St. Macrina. Maybe you don't know that she's actually the Macrina that you normally think of as Macrina the Younger. Macrina the Elder was her grandmother, and we're going to talk about that. Um, St. Macrina grew up in Cappadocia. Cappadocia is an incredible, again, region of Asia Minor. Um, beautiful territory, beautiful land. Um, lately on my, when my windows comes up on my computer, they've been showing that the, the, those wild cave um, hills, they're like little volcanic ash cones that people have dug caves into. And there's all these cave cities and cave communities in Cappadocia. Of course, this, this lent itself very well to the develop, uh, development of monasticism. And Macrina the Younger was one of these individuals who... Um, helped get that movement going for Christians in the third century, fourth century, third to fourth century, actually. So this is an icon which depicts that family. Um, up on the top there, it says uh, Agia Macrina. I don't know if that's meant to be Macrina the Elder or Macrina the Younger because below her are uh, Agia Theosivia and Agia Emilia, who are then daughters. And also um, you see these other um, noble figures uh, Basil the Great and um, Basil the Elder, which was her father. Basil the Great was her brother. Uh, this figure here, if you see my mouse moving around, is Nafkratios, which is her brother. Uh, there's also Peter Sebasti and Gregory of Nyssa. So it's a family loaded with holy people. And really... If, if, you could, if you could look at one family in the history of Christendom that influenced the world more than anyone else, it would have been this family. I mean, you have these incredible thinkers, these incredible figures, uh, the incredible patterns that they set forward for the rest of Christendom that are so important. In fact, um, Orthodox monasticism, for example, does not have orders of monastics like Benedictines and Franciscans. Sometimes to differentiate them, uh, they're called Basilian from St. Basil, uh, that they're, but there's no Basilian order. It's just the form of monasticism is, is influenced and imprinted upon by the communities that were started by these figures. And actually, Macrina is the one who inspired Basil to become a monastic. So a noble career, as, they, as her life will describe her and her brothers as well. She lived 329 to 380 AD. So she's just a little bit later, uh, kind of starting where Helen uh, departs. She is born and kind of will be the next, uh, another great example of a great woman saint for the, for the next age. Again, a distinguished Christian family of saints. She was a dedicated virgin, ascetic, and spiritual mother, but she was actually, um, like many women of her time, um, planning on getting married. In fact, she was engaged to her fiancé. But tragically, he died before they were married. And so uh, she decided that instead of marrying another, she would remain faithful to her fiancé and devoted her life to Christ as a nun after that. She was a teacher of the faith and, des and is described as a superior philosopher by those who knew her. Philosophy um, philosophy and theology were not so distinct from each other. Uh, we like to make that distinction now, like they practice philosophy, I practice theology. That's yeah. The ancients understood philosophy as the love of wisdom, right? And theology was the study of God. Philosophy, true theology was true philosophy, as well as being true prayer. We should diminish this idea. And for the Cappadocians and the others who were so well-schooled, in classical theology and classic rhetoric, they looked to Macrina who eschewed classical forms of education and preferred spiritual instruction and spiritual uh, study of scriptures as being the superior philosopher. That's how they looked at her and viewed her contribution to their lives. Uh, she was victorious to the end, a witness for the resurrection, a wonderful evangelist to those around her. So I said that she's described as a teacher. This lovely icon here, uh, it titles her Saint Macrina, the teacher, and it shows three of her brothers there, all of them bishops whom she taught, her younger brothers, basically, that, that learned from her in many different ways. Um, interestingly, the book about her that's, well, it's not a book, it's, you know, it's like an essay, 
The Life of Macrina, which was written by St. Gregory of Nyssa uh, after she died as, as a nice en encomium of her whole life. Uh, and really, uh, it's really a story of the whole family. If you read it, it talks about all the siblings and their relationships with each other and their influence, and their, especially the mother, uh, Amelia. Uh, Amelia Nee has such an important role in that story. But it's, it's uh, considered to be the first biography written about a woman, kind of exclusively that she's the subject. Um, even though women had been written about, of course, by Eusebius and other historians, this was kind of the first piece of, a, of that genre, if you will. And it's very easy to read and easy to find on the internet, by the way, if you're interested. Uh, another very important work by St. Gregory of, of Nyssa is called The Dialogue on the Soul and the Resurrection. You might have seen this, the little version of it uh, on, I think it's On the Soul and Resurrection is, is the title of it from St. Vladimir's press the little kind of patristic study series um a great bit of reading by the way and in it he writes it modeled on um plato's on the soul or phaedo in which you get this kind of socratic dialogue of the teacher and the student you know asking questions and then you know kind of sh the teacher keeps asking the questions to elicit the the student to come up with a solution right that's the method and she does that as the teacher and he calls her the teacher in the dialogue, definitely putting her in that position uh, of that figure. And it's, that's also an incredible read. Interestingly, of course, uh, if you if you know any, anything about this book, you know that uh, some have uh, tried to express uh, the th belief that um, Macrina and therefore Gregory of Nyssa were espousing universalist views, the idea that in the end, everyone will be saved. That's certainly... Um, a uh, uh, debatable position and actually quite anachronistic. Um, universalism, as we understand it today, is kind of very different than the various types of ideas that could be called called semi-universalist from the ancient world. Uh, so, but nonetheless, there it, has, it definitely has that kind of a sense that um, uh, it almost seems to suggest that hell is not forever. Let's put it that way. The description that you know when death happens to a soul that's unprepared. She, she describes it like a building that collapses on, on somebody. And uh, when you try to drag the person out of, from the rubble, you know, it's very painful because they're impaled or pierced with the rubble. And it's, she says that's kind of like how the soul is extricated from the body. And there's almost that uh, purgatorial process, if you will, after death. And so there's, it's definitely an interesting read in that respect. And a lot of ink has been shed over, over, over the implications of this writing. Um, she is very interesting, too, as literally the teacher. She, she humbled Basil in the life of Macrina. Gregory writes that, uh, you know, Basil came back from school really puffed up because he excelled in rhetoric against everybody else. And he really thought he was, you know, hot stuff. And um, it says he doesn't give the exact quote, but basically she cut him back down to size and told him to, to think about what really matters. And as a result, he actually was moved to become a monastic. And that's how he started his kind of ecclesiastical life. He could have probably made his life and living, especially if you've you know, read anything by St. Basil, you know this to be true, uh, as an incredible writer and rhetorician and philosopher of the day. But instead, her example inspired him to follow an ecclesiastical life and thank God for it. But in the, in the, in the story with uh, St. Gregory, while she's basically at the end of her days and he's visiting her towards the end of her life, he's kind of, he's kind of, that's pretty funny. He's like, he's kvetching about the challenges that he has, but also, you know, kind of saying, oh, but I'm doing okay. And it's working out pretty well. And he's, he's kind of fluffing himself up to his, to his big sister, right? And so this is what she says to him, which is so great. She kind of chides him. Do you fail to recognize the cause of such great blessings? That is your parents' prayers that are lifting you up on high, and you have little or no equipment within yourself for such success? That's great. You got nothing to do, you got nothing to do with it. Your parents are praying, and this is important. Your parents are praying for you. Both the parents by this point were dead. So she's saying that our saintly parents, who are now both canonized saints, basically, they're the ones lifting you up by your prayers. You have little or no equipment within yourself for such success. Very humbling, very humbling. Um, 
So if 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 uh, if you have a family member giving you grief, you can say, "Oh, do you not know you have little or no equipment within yourself for such success?" And see if they understand you, or just leave uh, in a hump. So uh, here is a, here is a passage from the life of Macrina, and if I could get a, a volunteer to read, I think this really exemplifies uh, both Gregory's love for her, but also the incredible role she plays in her own family. In this case, being the spiritual mother to her own mother. So if, if we have a reader who'd be willing to read this. Or pray to ask a call on somebody. Uh, how about Inna? Sure. When the cares of bringing up a family and the anxieties of the education and settling in life had come to an end and the property, a frequent course of worldliness, had been for the most part divided among the children, then, as I said above, the life of the Virgin became her mother's guide and led her on to his philosophical, philosophic and spiritual manner of life. And weaning her from all accustomed luxuries, Macrina drew her on to adopt her own standard of humility. She induced her to live on a footing of equality with the staff of maids, so as to share with them in the same food, the same kind of bed, and in all the necess necessaries of life, without any regard to differences of rank. Such was the manner of their life so great the height of their philosophy and so holy their conduct day and night as to make verbal description inadequate. What human words could make you realize such a life as this, a life on the borderline between human and spiritual nature, since living in the body and yet up to the likeness of the immaterial beings, they were not bowed down by the weight of the body, but their life was exalted to the skies and they walked on high in company with the powers of heaven thank you very much you can just see the the the, uh, the effulgence of his respect and his admiration for their way of life um i love that i love the description of the common life that she took uh, th these were wealthy people obviously and uh, sending you know the sons off to the best schools and learning the education that they had they were definitely you know at, at the top of their means basically but Macrina gives it all away and turns her home into what becomes basically a monastery. Those who were once servants live on the same footing with the one who was the mistress. And now she invites her own mother into it. Can you imagine doing that? Like, how would you like that? If you had worked your whole life or, you know, built this whole thing up your whole life and then at the end of your life, you just decided to super simplify. That's exactly how it was. Give it away, live a basic life, eat at the same table at the servants quarters, you know, think of your um, Downton Abbey imagery, you know, no more separate rooms, no more separate floors. Everybody's equal. Everybody lives the same. And it's a, a beautiful example of how, how a monastic life is meant to be lived in this kind of community, brotherhood or sisterhood in an angelic way. A life that's no longer concerned with these worldly affairs. Here's another story, um, actually prayer. St. Gregory records at length um, the prayer that she gave on her deathbed. This is actually the second half of it. The first half is also amazing. And the link at the bottom of this page, you can, you can find it. It's very easy. Finding solace.org, prayer of St. Macrina on her deathbed. Uh, but if we could have somebody read this for us, Alice J, please. Macrina's prayer on her deathbed. Oh, eternal God, you have been my refuge since I left my mother's womb. I love you with all my inmost strength. I devote myself, body and soul to you from my childhood onwards. Set now an angel of light beside me and bid him take my hand and lead me to the resting place where there is water for refreshment beside the dwellings of the Holy Fathers. The flaming sword you snapped in two, the man who hung upon the cross with you and implored your great mercy, you restored to paradise. Remember me too, now that you are back in your kingdom, since I also have hung upon the cross with you and the nails have pierced my flesh. 
for I have always feared your judgment. May the dread gulf not divide me from your elect or the slanderer stand in my way. May your eyes not rest upon my sins. If I have the weakness of human nature, I have fallen and sinned in word or deed or thought, forgive it me, for you have power to forgive sins on earth. When I am divested of my body, may I stand before you with my soul unspotted. Receive it blameless and faultless with your own hands. Thank you. Uh, on one hand, it's a prayer that only few could really dare to make, right? To say, since my childhood, I have followed you. And I have been nailed with the nails in my own flesh. I've hung upon the cross with you. This is the prayer of, of an exceptional person, a, a person who has lived a genuinely ascetic life in Christ. Um, but it still inspires. I love that. The flaming sword you snapped into the man who hung upon the cross with you and implored your great mercy, you restored to paradise. Remember me too. I also have hung on the cross with you. It's a beautiful prayer. St. Gregory, just like St. Constantine held the hand of his mother, Helen, at her deathbed, St. Gregory was with his sister and was close by with her as she passed as well. Uh, what a beautiful prayer. I think there's some aspects of this prayer we certainly could incorporate into our own life, uh, even in a modified form, you know, kind of a bedtime prayer as we lay ourselves down to sleep. Um, we often meditate upon death in those prayers, if you've ever seen them in the prayer book, you know, is this bed to be my grave, you know, or rather, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. This is like the Uber version of that prayer, basically. It's an incredible example of, of her faith. Okay. So questions for reflection from St. Macrina. Who checks you when you get too full of yourself? Who brings you down to earth? Do you have a friend like that? Do you have a family member like that? If you don't, find one. You need one. They are so valuable. I have been very blessed in my life to have some very important people in my life who are exactly the right people to say, you are so full of yourself. <laughs> or you need, to, you need to check yourself. You need to, you need to uh, think about what you're doing. And uh, St. Macrina was that kind of person. It's great to have those people in our lives. Uh, you don't want psychophants and, and um, yes men in your life. You want people that are going to be able to help you when you need it. At the same time, she was the oak of her family. When, um, when Nefcratius died young, she was there to help her mother. When Peter died, she was there for her mother. When Basil died, she was there. And when her mother died, she was there for the family still. She was the one that held the family together. Some of you uh, are blessed enough to come from families where you have somebody like that in your family. You know that when tragedy strikes, there's kind of that one person who kind of holds everybody together. And God forbid if that person should go down because then the whole family can fall apart. Uh, Gregory was, was worried when his sister died, what was going to happen? And I'm sure it was never the same after she passed. And that's why that life of hers was such an important thing to record and get down for posterity. Um, so who holds you together when tragedy strikes and who lifts you up when you're down because of their example? Do you have a person like that? Maybe it's the same person as the person who checks you. Uh, maybe it's not. Maybe it's somebody else. It's good to have one of those too. Uh, the challenge there is sometimes those people, you expect them to do it and then they fail. So we have to be forgiving too. Uh, Akrina uh, seems to have been, you know, batting a thousand with her in, in her brother's eyes, but I'm sure there was some who were frustrated at times with her because she was very strong in the way she did things. In the end, what is the kind of legacy that you want to leave to your family and your friends? What, what, what do you want your friends to take away from your life story? Many of you are young. You may not have gone to a lot of funerals. Count yourself both blessed and actually um, a little bit handicapped because if you go to a lot of funerals and you've seen a lot of that and heard a lot of that, you find out the measure of a person very often from their funeral, what kind of person they were 
it speaks through. And um, if a person's life was filled with grace, their funeral can be filled with grace. Even if, even if they've outlived everybody, there's only a few people there. Um, and somebody who dies young with a lot of friends, if they had no grace in their life, their funeral is going to be kind of uh, a disappointment. Let's put it that way. It's going to feel unresolved as if just what didn't reach what it should have. So it's an amazing thing. We should be thinking about those things even when we're young. We should be concerned, especially with our children, if we have them, what kind of example we want to live to leave to them uh, and to our other family members. Macrina was an ascetic, was a virgin, never married. She was the mother of many, many people spiritually. And that image of her has endured all these centuries since. It was that powerful of an example. The last person, my favorite one for tonight, Tamar Sacardvelo. Probably don't know where Sacardvelo is, but Sacardvelo is the name of the country that Westerners call Georgia. And in ancient times, the Byzantines called Iberia. But the locals call Sacardvelo. And that is in the Caucasus region in Central Asia, right on the eastern coast of the Black Sea. And Tamar is one of their most illustrious medieval rulers. And here is her title. She's like the original Khaleesi, for those of you who know what that means. Here's her title. By the will of God, King of Kings and Queen of Queens of the Abkhazians, Kardvelians, Iranians, Kakhetians, and Armenians, Shervan Shah and Shahan Shah, autocrat of all the East and the West, glory of the world and faith, champion of the Messiah. I'm pumped just hearing that. I want to know more. Who is this Tamar? This is an incredible story. If you don't know about Tamara or Tamar of Georgia, you need to find out. Now, let's get into it. Oh, by the way, go. this is a coin with her a monogram, this little weird symbol here, this kind of X with weird symbols. That's actually her personal monogram symbols. She got her own symbol. If you like to draw that on something. Uh, so here's a map of the kingdom of Georgia with its extent over the, uh, the height of her period in the late 12th century, early 13th century, the Black Sea and the, uh, the was that the Caspian, whatever it's called today, back then. Here's a wonderful statue of her with her orb of rulership. So uh, she lived again in that time period, born around 1166, died 1220, too young. That's only what about 44, but what a life she lived. She became co-regent with her father, the king, at only 12 years of age. And she became king at 18. And they used the term king for her. They had The Georgian language was such that ruler was kind of a, a non-gendered term, but they did have a separate term for queen. So they called her king and queen, both. Uh, but to be clear that she was the king and not the consort of the king, they used the term king for her because the term for queen could be read as the consort of the king. So one step lower, basically. So she was clearly the king of Georgia, Sarkarvelo. She was married in 1185 to a guy named Yuri Bogolyubsky. Now, this guy, uh, unfortunately, started uh, with a promising life. He was the son of uh, Andrei uh, Bogolyubsky, who was the king of Vladimir Suzdal, uh, a, uh, one of those kind of Slavic principalities. Unfortunately, um, he suffered... Um, a gruesome political death slash martyrdom, and uh, Yuri was sent into exile and had to kind of grow up on the run, kind of a political refugee, but with some noble status. And so that was considered to be a potentially very good mix for the country of Georgia, and they recommended uh, him to her. Unfortunately, he, uh, uh, fortunately for her, he was ex excellent as a soldier and a warrior, and uh, did bring some military uh, victories to the feet of his king-queen um, as her consort. But, 
Unfortunately, he was also given to much wine and rumors had it to um, certain proclivities of an immoral character. And as a result, she banished her immoral husband to Constantinople, at first with a generous allowance, so he wouldn't cause any trouble, but he did. And a couple times he attempted to uh, foist her off the throne and take the throne from herself until finally he was finally kicked to the curb for good. Unhappy story. But she remarried uh, in 1195 to a guy named Dave. David. David was a popular name in the, uh, in the Georgian kingdom. And she had two children who had gone on to be her successor heirs, uh, a stable marriage and, and a dynasty as a result of that. She was able to consolidate power in the kingdom. She de defeated rivals like Yuri. Um, she was even able eventually to, she, she had a pushback. Her, she didn't have absolute autocratic authority. There was a kind of a council, uh, a seated council that had to be consulted, had to approve things. Of course, the patriarch Catholicos of Georgia, the head of the Georgian Orthodox Church, was a very important figure. Um, he pushed for... Um, position as kind of a, a magistrate advisor on that council and, and for a while held it. But over time, she was able to push back on all of those things and increase the power of her rule um, and secure herself. What is one of the outstanding aspects of her story is that when, uh, and it was more than once, the kingdom was um, being attacked by invaders, usually Persians or um, uh Arabs from the Caliphate, for example, uh, she would personally be with her troops and would lead them not necessarily into physical battle herself. She wasn't a soldier saint, if you will, but she would be there with them as they were preparing for battle. And she would pray on her knees, barefoot through the entire battle and make sure that they understood that it was God who was going to give them the victory and instilled in them this belief and this faith um, because Georgia was one of the most ancient Christian countries and it was surrounded pretty much on all sides by enemies. Uh, even the Byzantines were friends, but competitors, right? A political rivals to a certain extent. So, and especially at that time in history, by the way, it was a difficult time. So the need for this, this, this understanding of, of her role was, was really important. Uh, this picture here of this interesting cliff face and cave dwellings and things like that is the, is the ruins of Vardzia. This was um, one of these, uh, similar to Cappadocia, they had these massive uh, cave systems. This was a massive cave complex, monastery, refuge. It was considered to be nigh impregnable. It was a place of refuge. Uh, she would go there. She had her own quarters there when, when times called for it. And um, so that, that's an that's important part of her story is this incredible fortress place. I love this stuff because, it's, you know, you realize that stories that you see in things like Game of Thrones or, 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 or uh, medieval fantasies and things like that, sometimes the, the true stories can be even more exceptional than the fictions. Now, here is uh, from the histories. A description of, let's see, which one is this? Oh, yes, this is her address to the, to the church authorities. Uh, throughout the history of Orthodox Christianity, there's, there's been the creative tension since, especially the time of Constantine, of, of earthly authority and rulership and, and ecclesiastical rulership. And what role does the church have to the state and to especially the monarchies and things like that. And the, the description of this has been, has been put um, as in the term symphonia as the kind of the idea of symphony or harmony, if you will, between these two bodies that they both have their perspective spheres. They mutually inform each other and they work cooperatively with each other, creating a greater harmony or symphony out of the whole. This is kind of a, a her expressing this idea to the churches uh, to establish this relationship within her kingdom. Could we have somebody uh, read us the words of the saint? Great to ask call on somebody if they're shy. Tatiana. Okay, let me do 
Uh, judge according to righteousness, affirming good and condemning evil, she advised, begin with me. If I sin, I should be censure, censured, for the royal crown is sent down from above as a sign of divine service. Allow neither the wealth of the nobles nor the poverty of the masses to hinder your work. You by word and I by deed, you by preaching and I by the law, you by upbringing and I by education will care for those souls whom God has entrusted to us and together we will abide by the law of God in order to escape eternal condemnation. You as priest and I as ruler, you as stewards of good and I as the watchman of that good. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is this is uh, one of the most um, succinct and, and um, perfect uh, expressions of this concept of symphonia that you will see and hear from this the humble words of the saint. I, uh, I love that, um, you know, the understanding that the crown is sent down from above as a sign of divine service. This is an important idea, this, this idea of divine service. Uh, it has been stated that in the Byzantine um, community, in the Roman Empire of Christendom, in the East especially, the role of empire, of emperor, was almost a sacerdotal one, was almost a priestly one. And that's, in fact, if you notice behind me, the, 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 the gate that you open to get into the altar is called the royal doors. And the only reason for that is because that's the doors that the emperor would go through when he would come in for communion. And today, only the bishops will enter the altar through these doors as the both the inheritor of the, the bishopric, but also in many senses, inheritors of the, of the uh, role of the emperor as ethnarchs in the Byzantine communion. That's a whole long story in itself I don't want to get into. But nonetheless, this idea of divine service, that, that being a ruler was an element that was ordained is an important idea to this understanding of it. It's different than divine right, by the way. I should make that clear. It's because divine right is God gave us this and it's our right to rule, right? But this is really, this is a calling to serve. And you see how she describes it. You will teach, you will upbring people, you will minister, and I will through my exercising of the law and exercising of the governmental power and authority uh, and the watch the watchman role of the government, the protective role of the government will also play the part that is ordained to me. So this is a really um, good, succinct expression of this kind of medieval Christian Eastern idea of symphonia and, and rulership. Okay. The next one, I love this one. So um, when Sultan Rukin al-Din attempted to invade, he made Queen Tamar a lovely offer. He said, guess what? If you marry me and become a Muslim, I'll give you everything and everything will be good for everybody. And we won't have to fight and there won't be any battles and you can we can all just get along as long as you submit to me and to Islam. And this is what she said in reply. Would somebody like to read this? This is great fun. Come on, somebody wants to. You know it. Let me ask Jess. You there? You haven't done one. Anybody? shy today. There you go, Cindy. Your proposal takes into consideration your wealth and the vastness of your armies, but fails to account for divine judgment, Tamar wrote. While I place my trust not in any army or worldly thing, but in the right hand of the almighty God and the infinite aid of the cross, which you curse. The will of God and not your own shall be fulfilled and the judgment of God, and not your judgment, shall reign. Yeah, 
she threw it back in his face, basically. It said that when this, uh, when the emissary of uh, uh, Ruth Canal Dean came and gave the terms that uh, the, uh, the the minister of, of the queen was so incensed by the audacity of it that he knocked the guy out. Uh, but she, she uh, did not want that. She gave the stern message, but she made sure that the emissary was well taken care of and shown hospitality after that unfortunate incident. But I think that's a good uh, testimony to the Georgian character. In any case, they did go to war. And guess what happened? He didn't win. The judgment of God, that's what stood firm. And she was able to maintain her kingdom in peace all the days of her, well, in security, I won't say in peace, because basically this whole period, there was constant threats. Um, it's the medieval world, as you can guess. There's always somebody around the corner waiting to attack. But she was able to keep her kingdom secure and actually, uh, and to a certain extent, expand its power and influence in her reign. And this is her prayer uh, at her deathbed. We've had a kind of a theme tonight. Not only leadership in life, but leadership in facing death, the ultimate challenger, right? The ultimate test that any one of us is ever going to face is how we face our own death. St. Helen, incredible. Macrina, incredible. Tamar, three for three. Faithful to the end. By the way, this is... Um, uh, image up at the top here is her actual signature from a document from 1203, that beautiful flowing Georgian script. And down below here is supposedly, I couldn't confirm it, but this is described as the cross of Queen Tamar from also the same time period. So this might have been the cross at which she was holding when she said her final prayer. I'm not sure. I can't tell you. Probably not such a heavy cross if you're lying in bed sick, but nonetheless, she would have had it nearby. Lord Jesus Christ, omnipotent master of heaven and earth, to thee I deliver the nation and people that were entrusted to my care and purchased by thy precious blood, the children whom thou didst bestow upon me, and to thee I surrender my will, O Lord. The same, the same recognition that in the end, it's all been God's grace, it's all been by the strength of the cross, it's all been by the help of the hand of the Almighty, and Unto the Almighty, she returns it. Faithful to the end of her life, she is this incredible figure in, in Christian history. I wish more people knew about her. Um, you know, there's so the so few examples like this, unfortunately, in, in history, but she's such a great and, and wonderful image of a ruler, Christian ruler. So her legacy endures, um, even though in the West she's not as well known. Her time period is considered, with, with some of the rulers on both sides of her, but really her in the middle of it, the golden age of medieval Georgia. Really, the kingdom of Georgia met, reached its apogee in her reign. Uh, also, she was uh, in, 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 instrumental in the formation of what would be called the Empire of Trebizond. What happened in 1204, for those of you who remember? The sack of Constantinople, the Fourth Crusade. Um, it was a crisis in the region and destabilized Byzantine Empire was not a good thing for the kingdom of Georgia. So what did she do? She helped create a border state uh, to her west along the um, south shore of the Black Sea, which would be called the Empire of Trebizond, which kind of stood as a buffer state, but also secured the interests of the Georgian nation on its uh, flank there. So a uh, very important part of the politics of that region at the time. She also was instrumental in um, the relationship of the Georgian people and the Georgian Orthodox Church to the Holy Land and to Mount Athos, which at this time was still kind of just had been really only going strong, I would say, for maybe a couple hundred years as a monastic peninsula. So it was still just kind of get, getting its footing in if you will, in, in church history terms. And uh, the Georgian people uh, were very involved with the establishment of Ivaron uh, Monastery on Mount Athos. So they played that role, but also a very important role in sponsoring the Holy Land, protecting the Holy Land. Really, uh, to understand what's going on here is that with the, with the decline of 
uh, Constantinople and the uh, Roman emperors of Constantinople. I don't call them Byzantines usually because they call themselves Romans. There needed to be new defenders of Christendom against the Islamic waves and the Islamic kingdoms, especially in the Holy Land, uh, which, you know, you had this back and forth with the Crusades going on. So she kind of took upon herself the role as a defender of Christendom on a broader scale than just her own nation. That's why she can be called glory of the faith in the world and champion of Christ or champion of the Messiah. Uh, she's one of those kind of figures. There's other figures too. We have some uh, in the borderlands and the Balkans that rise to the occasion and so forth. Uh, and of course, in the, in the Russian state, they'll, they'll, they'll take upon themselves some of this as well. But she definitely has part of that going on. Uh, as you might imagine, she's a very influential figure in, there, in the history of Georgia and inspired a great deal of art, literature, and religious veneration and piety, you name it. This uh, image here is actually um, from an illuminated manuscript uh, dedicated in her time uh, in, the, in the early 13th century there. She has continued to inspire the modern uh, Georgian state um, through the kind of the romanticism of, of Tamar uh, has, has been different because it's been within the context of the Georgian nationalism. And um, so it's a little bit different than kind of the sappy romanticism of, say, you know, the West or something where they completely fictionalize the life of the character. She's, she's still reverenced as a genuine historical figure, uh, but continues to inspire. And of course, she is a saint of the Orthodox Church and uh, is venerated... Um, I believe it's May 1st in the calendar. I should look on my calendar here. It'll say. It doesn't say on that one. But I think we commemorated her. May, 4, May 14th on the old calendar. And uh, actually the Antiochians also commemorate her, I believe, on April 22nd for some reason. Yeah, these are the Vani Gospels from the 12th century. Or whatever that was. This is a lovely quote here that I wanted to end uh, with from a modern uh, writer, Georgian writer, Grigo uh, Rabakice, called Tamar, and I love this. Thus far, nobody knows where Tamar's grave is. She belongs to everyone and to no one. Her grave is in the heart of the Georgian. And in the Georgian's perception, this is not a grave, but a beautiful vase in which the unfading flower, the great Tamar, flourishes. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to take that vase into your own heart so that this is true not only of the Georgian people, but of all Christian people, because she certainly uh, should be that for all of us as well. She, she is our, we don't have Joan of Arc in the East. We have Tamar of Georgia. She's really our figure who rises above the rest and, you know, rides with the forces of her people and defends her nation against its enemies. So just an incredible figure. I hope you enjoyed learning about her. Your last questions for reflection for this evening. What does it mean to be a strong woman? Should that even be a question? And is there more than one answer? I said that should they even be a question because uh, some of you might remember a few years ago, I think it was Joss Whedon, when he was doing the Avengers movies, they would ask him about, what about all the strong women characters you write in your TV shows? Well, this goes back to like, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and all these shows. Yeah. He's like, he got tired of being asked about strong women. He's like, well, why wouldn't there be? Why should we even ask that question? What does it mean to be a strong woman? Should we even ask the question? I don't know. But I would say that people like the saints we've looked at exemplify what it can mean. And there's certainly more than one answer if you look at each of their lives. What is the relationship between leadership and faith? We've been kind of talking around it in terms of maybe political power or personal family power. But in general, what is the relationship between leadership and faith? What are some of the challenges of being a Christian in a leadership position? Some of you have been in leadership positions at work, at school, in your churches, or even in just in your families you know that there's pressure, there's responsibilities, there's a weight that's on you when you're a leader. There are expectations. 
sometimes it's really nice to not have to be in that position. Sometimes it's nice to be able to just be a disciple. But um, there is a relationship to leadership and faith. It also has to do with being a disciple. That's why we started with discipleship in the very beginning of class one. And lastly, uh, your kind of home meditation then is, how can I serve Christ by being a leader? Leadership is, is uh, not everybody maybe should be a leader, but some people are called to leadership. And sometimes we're asked to lead for a short time. And even if we're not called to be a leader as a calling in our life, we can all practice leadership from time to time as a form of discipleship, actually. So how can you serve Christ by being a leader? Right now, uh, you may think, well, that's really hard because I can't even leave my house or something like that. But of course, you can leave your house vocally, mentally, visually, just not with your corporally, right? You can definitely do a lot of things and you can take the lead on a number of different things in your community, in your church, in your families. How can you serve Christ in a leadership role, even if it's just for a while, for a short stint, for a tour of duty? I like to tell parish council members, think of it as a tour of duty, not a life sentence. Some people like to, they're careerists, so they want to be on council forever. But some people, it's good to just go for a few years, take a break, come back later sometime. We all have the opportunity to lead, and we should um, take advantage of that if we can. So that concludes my class for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, clarifications, I will definitely do my best to answer them for you. Feel free to ask. Otherwise, we'll close with a prayer. Prayer Tassa, if you see one, say something because I'm going to get my book. Any questions? No? Oh, I hope you enjoyed it. Please send me some feedback. Let me know if you're enjoying these classes. Let's close with a prayer, shall we? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shine, 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 O New Jerusalem, the glory of the Lord has shone on you. Exalt now, exalt, and be glad, O Zion. Be radiant, O pure Theotokos, in the resurrection, the resurrection of your Son. Christ is risen. Truly he is Truly risen. He is risen. Thank you. All right, everybody. God bless you. Thank you, Father.